Hey everyone, so I was recently watching an atheist versus theist debate. It was between Matt Dillahunty and someone named Stuart Connectly, I think it is. I believe that's how he himself pronounces it. It took place on a YouTube channel called Modern Day Debate. You may be familiar with it. And I've seen Stuart as well as his father debate atheists on that channel several times. But this particular time, Stuart made the claim in passing that three of the most popular or prominent atheists of the 20th century, namely Jean-Paul Sartre, I know some people say Sartre, I'm going with Sartre, Albert Camus, some people say Albert, I'm choosing what's closer to the French pronunciations, Albert Camus and A.N. Wilson had all converted to Christianity before their deaths. And I was just curious whether this was true or not, and so decided to do some research. But here's the clip. What I find so interesting, I just learned today, is it relevant? 20th century, the, the most, three most famous atheists of the 20th century, arguably, A.N. Wilson, Sartre, and Camus, all became Christians before they died. Didn't know that. Sartre was buddied up with a pastor who gave him all these reasons, all this evidence. Camus, it was a meaning thing. It was like, okay, there's ultimate meaning out there and purpose. And then Ian Wilson, it was a more, it was a moral argument. And so I don't know if it's just me, but before this, I had never heard of Ian Wilson. So I don't know how popular they actually are or were in atheist circles. All my time watching atheist content creators reading books on atheism, watching atheist versus theist debates, and I don't think I have ever heard that name. In fact, I thought Stuart was saying Ann Wilson, and I stupidly tried looking for a philosopher by that name online uh, without any luck. But Ann Wilson does happen to be the name of the lead singer of Heart. You ever hear their cover of uh, Led Zeppelin's The Battle of Evermore? It'll blow your mind. And every time I hear the song These Dreams, I think of Nestle Alpine White Chocolate Bars. I think they may have used the song in a commercial when I was a kid. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. I think, once again, he was saying A. N. Wilson as an Andrew Norman Wilson, not a philosopher per se, but rather an English writer and columnist. But he is known for writing about history and religion and does seem to at least have an interest in philosophy to some degree. And he's also widely known for shedding his atheist worldview and returning to faith, which is why I think this is probably who Stuart uh, Connectly, once again I think it is, was referring to. But I noticed a bit of a problem or inconsistency. He's describing these people as having returned to Christianity before their deaths, almost suggesting that they may have underwent deathbed conversions or something to that effect. But A.N. Wilson is still alive. He's 72 and it looks like he just published an autobiography last year. And so I believe originally Wilson was an Anglican and then moved to Catholicism before becoming an atheist and then eventually or ultimately, as already mentioned, returning to faith again. But I found a few short paragraphs that kind of illustrate his thinking during these different phases. And this is from the blog or webpage of a Christian writer and pastor by the name of Conrad Hilario. And the article is entitled, Doubting Your Doubts About God, A.N. Wilson's Return to Faith. Kind of a clever title. And so it begins, The prolific English author and columnist A.N. Wilson graduated from Oxford in the early 70s and considered going into the Anglican ministry but he lost his faith by the 80s. He called himself an atheist and wrote a short book entitled Against Religion, Why We Should Try to Live Without It. He describes his conversion to atheism. I realized that after a lifetime of church going, the whole house of cards had collapsed for me. The sense of God's presence in life, 
and the notion that there was any kind of God, let alone a merciful God, in this brutal, nasty world, it was a nonsense. The idea of a personal God or a loving God in a suffering universe, nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. It was such a relief to discard it all. For months I walked on air. And then he goes into how he began to doubt his atheism. My doubting temperament, however, made me a very unconvincing atheist. And unconvinced. My hilarious Camden Town neighbor, Colin Haycraft, used to say, I do wish Freddy, the British philosopher A.J. Eyre, wouldn't go around calling himself an atheist. It implies that he takes religion seriously. This creed that religion can be dispatched in a few brisk arguments, outlined in David Hume's masterly dialogues concerning natural religion, and then laughed off, kept me going for some years. When I found myself wavering, I would return to Hume in order to pull myself together. And then the article goes into how he finally succumbed to faith, he startled many people when he announced his return to faith in the New Statesman, a British magazine. Uh, he found, quote-unquote, materialist atheism totally irrational because it couldn't account for, quote-unquote, complexities of human existence. And then there's um, a paragraph down below that I believe is in Wilson's own words once again. I haven't mentioned morality. But one thing that finally put the tin hat on any aspirations to be an unbeliever was writing a book about the Wagner family in Nazi Germany and realizing how utterly incoherent were Hitler's neo-Darwinian ravings and how potent was the opposition, much of it from Christians, paid for not with clear intellectual victory but in blood. Read Pastor Bonhoeffer's book Ethics and ask yourself what sort of mad world is created by those who think that ethics are a purely human construct. Think of Bonhoeffer's serenity before he was hanged, even though he was in love and had everything to look forward to. And I'm trying not to inject too much of my personal philosophy or views in this episode, but that strikes me, as moving as it is, as kind of a weak argument against atheism. I don't think you need belief in a higher power or a personal creator god in order to explain ethics, uh, where social animals who seem to have a natural tendency towards tribalism and violence, but also altruism and empathy. And I don't think you need to go too much further than that to explain human nature. And it continues, My departure from faith was like a conversion on the road to Damascus. My return was slow, hesitant, doubting. So it will always be. But I know I shall never make the same mistake again. One famous philosopher called God, quote-unquote, a category mistake. Yet the real category mistake made by atheists is not about God, but about human beings. Turn to Samuel Taylor Coleridge, English composer and conductor. Read the first chapter of Genesis without prejudice, and you will be convinced at once. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And then Coleridge adds, and man became a living soul. Materialism will never explain those last words. And so I've been a fan of Samuel Taylor Coleridge ever since I had to read uh, The Rime of the Ancient Mariner in high school. And I love the Iron Maiden song by the same name, <laughs> inspired by that poem. But once again, this seems like a pretty weak argument by Wilson, to be honest. So I guess technically, Connectly isn't wrong. It's strange, it sounds like a strategy game, Connectly, or maybe a social media platform. But Ian Wilson did convert before his death. He just happens to still be alive. But if my layman's understanding of biology is correct, he will eventually be dead at some point. So let's now move on to French philosopher, author, dramatist, and Nobel Prize winner Albert Camus. I've been aware of Camus for quite some time. They even mentioned him on Northern Exposure once, 
one of my favorite TV shows, but there was still a lot I didn't know about him, including the fact that he was apparently in Paris when the Nazis invaded, and after unsuccessfully attempting to flee, eventually joined the French resistance, becoming the editor of a band or clandestine newspaper called Combat. Camus often, and I would argue rather understandably, gets lumped in with the existentialists such as his friend, Jean-Paul Sartre, who we'll talk about in a bit, but Camus rejected the label existentialist, embracing instead his notion of the absurd and referring to himself for a time as a philosopher of the absurd, something which he apparently regretted later on. Camus seems to have viewed labels in general as being somewhat problematic, something which I can relate to. You've probably heard me juggle or shuffle self-consciously through terms like non-believer, atheist, skeptic, agnostic atheist, or even seeker in an attempt to try to find a term that accurately describes my worldview without pigeonholing myself, you know? But supposedly the roots of absurdism can be traced back, at least in part, to Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, who, along with other philosophers such as Nietzsche or Nietzsche and his friend Sartre, had influenced Camus. But it's thought that absurdism became established as a philosophical position with Camus and the ideas laid out in his essay, The Myth of Sisyphus. At the heart of absurdism is the notion that when man, a conscious being endowed with reason and in need of attributing meaning to life, is in response confronted with the unreasonable silence, as I think it's put, of the universe or world, he realizes the absurdity or meaninglessness of life. Camus writes, In a universe suddenly divested of illusions and lights, man feels an alien, a stranger. His exile is without remedy, since he is deprived of the memory of a lost home or the hope of a promised land. This divorce between man and his life, the actor and his setting, is properly the feeling of absurdity. As grim as this sounds, Camus didn't propose giving in to nihilism. He advocated quote-unquote revolt, affirming or embracing the absurdity of life and continuing on despite it, writing also, One of the only coherent philosophical positions is thus revolt. It is a constant confrontation between man and his own obscurity. It is an insistence upon an impossible transparency. It challenges the world anew every second. It is not aspiration, for it is devoid of hope. That revolt is the certainty of a crushing fate, without the resignation that ought to accompany it. And then also there's the following. It may be thought that suicide follows revolt, but wrongly, revolt gives value to life. To a man devoid of blinders, there is no finer sight than that of the intelligence at grips with a reality that transcends it. And that's from Camus' The Myth of Sisyphus. And of course, in Greek myth, Sisyphus was condemned by the gods to endlessly roll a boulder uphill, only to have it roll all the way back down again. Camus envisioned Sisyphus as the absurd hero who, with a kind of defiant dignity, embraces his seemingly meaningless or pointless labor, and he concludes his essay with the words, One must imagine that Sisyphus is happy. And just for good measure, I'll actually read the excerpt. I leave Sisyphus at the foot of the mountain. One always finds one's burden again. But Sisyphus teaches the higher fidelity that negates the gods and raises rocks. He too concludes that all is well. This universe henceforth without a master seems to him neither sterile nor futile. Each atom of that stone, each mineral flake of that night-filled mountain, in itself forms a world. The struggle itself toward the heights is enough to fill a man's heart. One must imagine Sisyphus happy. The exact wording varies depending on the particular translation. The allegorical meaning of the plague in Camus' 1947 novel of the same name is open to interpretation, 
but it's thought by some literary critics to function as a metaphor for the Nazi invasion faced by the French resistance, or perhaps for human suffering in general or the plight of the human condition. One character says, I have realized that we all have plague, and I have lost my peace, and today I'm still trying to find it, still trying to understand all those others, and not to be the enemy of anyone. I only know that one must do what one can to cease being plague-stricken, and that's the only way in which we can hope for some peace, or failing that, a decent death. This and only this can bring relief to men, and if not save them, at least do them the least harm possible, and even, sometimes, a little good. And I have to admit I wasn't aware of this at the time, but apparently, interest in Camus' novel, The Plague, became greatly renewed during the 2020 COVID lockdown, to the point where supposedly certain publishers even struggled to keep up with demand. As mentioned previously, Camus wasn't exactly crazy about labels, and that includes the label Atheist. In his notebooks, one can find the seemingly paradoxical statement, I do not believe in God, and I am not an atheist. One theory I came across while researching this episode about what Camus may have meant here is that even though he lacked belief in a higher power, the existence of one couldn't be completely ruled out. Which is basically my standpoint, which is why I often refer to myself as an agnostic atheist. The agnostic part referring to a knowledge claim, I don't claim to know whether or not there's a god, and then the atheist part referring to the fact that I personally lack belief or don't believe or have some pretty strong doubts. And I don't mean to speak for anyone, but I think, just speaking from personal experience, I think a lot of atheists are technically agnostic atheists. They doubt the existence of a higher power. They don't buy into the supernatural faith claims of man-made religions. But at the end of the day, they have enough humility to admit that they can't be 100% certain or prove with 100% certainty whether there is or isn't some higher power out there. But apparently, despite being labeled as an atheist and an existentialist, Camus had a somewhat sympathetic or respectful attitude towards believers and advocated productive conversation and engagement with them, which I think is a good thing. And here's another interesting quote from his notebooks. Tear out the final page of the gospel and you have a human religion. A cult of solitude and greatness is offered to us. And supposedly what Camus meant by this is that tear out the last page, the end of the story, the resurrection, the miraculous, etc., and you have the makings for an ethical, humanistic religion. Something to that effect. And it makes me think of Thomas Jefferson and his so-called Jefferson Bible. Jefferson was a deist. He believed at best in a kind of non-interventionalist God, and he literally took a razor to the Bible and cut out the miraculous bits, leaving only the wise teachings or sayings of Jesus. In the myth of Sisyphus, while referencing Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov, I believe, Camus says the following, let us note this carefully in conclusion. What contradicts the absurd in that work is not its Christian character, but rather its announcing a future life. It is possible to be Christian and absurd. There are examples of Christians who do not believe in a future life. So perhaps he's referencing people who are culturally or nominally Christian or who embrace the ethics without literally believing in the supernatural faith claims, etc. But I have to admit that when I first heard Stuart Connectly a lump Camus in with atheists that had converted to Christianity before their deaths, I was automatically skeptical because I knew that Camus had died suddenly um, in a car accident at the relatively young age of 46. I believe that was back in 1960. But back in 2000, someone named Howard Muma, or Mama, I believe, M-U-M-M-A, 
released an autobiographical book entitled Albert Camus and the Minister. Muma, or Mama, had been a Methodist minister from Ohio, and he claimed to have befriended Camus while temporarily serving as a minister or in some other religious capacity at an American church in France. Okay, supposedly Camus had, I don't know what that means, Uh, maybe you do, supposedly Camus had gone, is it like an embassy? I don't know, had gone to the church to hear the music of a famous organist. He also claims that shortly before his death, Camus had requested to be baptized, but died in the aforementioned car accident before he could be. Mama or Muma had apparently advised holding off on the baptism, One of his reasons was that Camus had technically already been baptized as an infant, having been raised Catholic. Now, Mama, or Muma, take a drink, was roughly 90 at the time he wrote the book, and it had been 40 years since Camus' death. And in fairness, he supposedly acknowledges his own bias and possible inaccuracies in the book's foreword. I notice that the reviews, at least on sites like Goodreads, tend to be largely negative, with people familiar with Camus' works being generally skeptical of the author's claims. And of course, negative reviews don't prove anything in and of themselves, and people on the other side could easily argue it's just sour grapes or admirers of Camus and his work not wanting to believe that he may have abandoned his philosophical worldview. But I suppose it's nevertheless something to take into consideration or keep in mind. As far as I can tell, the idea that Camus converted to Christianity before his death mainly comes from this one particular book, and perhaps frustratingly, only Mama or Muma, the author, Moomin Chance, and Camus know that Moomin Chance was on Northern Exposure too, and Camus uh, are the only ones who know the truth, and they're both gone. I assume Howard Muma is gone, seeing as he was 90 when he wrote the book over 20 years ago now. Moomin Chance or Moomin Chance? Huh. But let's move on to Sartre. Jean-Paul Sartre is perhaps arguably the most well-known of the existentialists. And he had a lot in common with Camus. They both worked on the aforementioned uh, clandestine newspaper of the French Resistance. They were both awarded Nobel Prizes, although Sartre declined his. And like Camus, Sartre was also a writer and dramatist or playwright. And as mentioned, the two were friends, but they would ultimately have a falling out over philosophical differences. Perhaps the two men were also alike in the sense that the depth or degree of their lack of belief seemed to fluctuate, or that the question of God or his perceived absence was, perhaps like for many of us, is something they continued to struggle or wrestle with throughout their lives. In his book, Being in Nothingness, Sartre describes himself as having had a quote-unquote mystic crisis in his teens, and in his autobiography notably refers to the quote-unquote absence of God rather than God's non-existence. He also referred to God as a, once again, quote-unquote, old flame, and describes atheism quote-unquote, drink up, as a cruel long-term business, and I have gone through it to the end. And I believe the following quote is from his Essays on Aesthetics. That God does not exist, I cannot deny. That my whole being cries out for God, I cannot forget. As a young man, Satra had been conscripted into the army and even spent time in a German prisoner of war camp before ultimately returning to Paris and joining the resistance. He's quoted as saying, I do not believe in God. His existence has been disproved by science. But in the concentration camp, I learned to believe in men. In his 1943 essay, A New Mystic, he declares in a proclamation reminiscent of Nietzsche, God is dead. Let us not understand by this that he does not exist, or even that he no longer exists. He is dead. He spoke to us and is silent. We no longer have anything but his cadaver. 
Perhaps he slipped out of the world, somewhere else like the soul of a dead man. Perhaps he was only a dream. God is dead. Perhaps we can be a bit more certain of Sartre's quote-unquote conversion than that of Camus. Uh, near the end of Sartre's life, a young philosopher and activist named Pierre Victor, born Benny Levy, I think it's pronounced, conducted a series of interviews with the dying philosopher. Pierre Victor wasn't just some random interviewer. He was also Sartre's personal secretary and protege. According to Victor, the dying Satra drastically changed his view on the existence of God and began drifting towards Messianic Judaism, a type of Protestant Christianity that incorporates aspects of Judaism and Jewish tradition. Apparently, during the course of these interviews, Satra said the following, I do not feel that I am the product of chance, a speck of dust in the universe, but someone who was expected, prepared, prefigured, in short, a being whom only a creator could put here. And this idea of a creating hand refers to God. Sartre was in a decades-long open relationship with fellow philosopher, writer, and social activist Simone de Beauvoir, who would later angrily state, How should one explain this senile act of a turncoat? All my friends, all the Sartreans, and the editorial team of Le Thème Moderne supported me in my consternation. So apparently even Satra's life partner believed the claim he had converted in a sense. I say in a sense because, although it seems he had shifted towards theism and had developed an interest in Messianic Judaism, I think it's still uncertain whether he officially converted to Messianic Judaism or not. I'm not sure. But close enough, I suppose, he does seem to have embraced theism, at least according to, uh... Pierre Victor, a.k.a. Benny Levy. And Benny Levy was an existentialist and a Marxist, at least early on, and had even worked as an editor for a Maoist newspaper, which led him to be um, repeatedly arrested by French police. But while working with Sartre, he began to explore Judaism. Being born in Egypt, he hadn't experienced a Jewish upbringing, but had now developed an interest. He apparently researched Kabbalah with Sartre, as bizarre as that sounds. Despite her anger at Sartre himself for betraying his principles, Simone de Beauvoir would also accuse Levy of brainwashing Sartre and of faking his writings. So there could be some merit to the idea that this young philosopher with a newfound interest in religion himself could have had some kind of undue influence over the dying Satra. But in fairness, I guess you could argue that Christian apologist or debater Stuart Connectley wasn't too far off. A.N. Wilson, although technically not dead, returned to faith. In fairness, I imagine it must be significantly harder to convert after you're dead, especially if there's no afterlife. Uh, Camus, maybe, maybe not. All we really have to go by is Howard Mumma or Mumma's book. And Sartre, it looks like, as far as we can tell, did gravitate towards theism near the end, specifically Messianic Judaism. Was he unduly influenced by Pierre Victor, a.k.a. Benny Levy? I don't know. Uh, it does seem like Stuart um, Connectly did mix up Camus and Sartre, though. It was Camus who had, quote-unquote, buddied up with a pastor or minister, and Sartre who seems to have found some kind of deeper sense of meaning. Personally, at the end of the day, I don't think it really affects me too much. Even if their conversions are genuine, uh, you know, I have a love of philosophy, and I think a single philosophical idea can have the power to vastly change a person's point of view or how they look at the world. But in regard to my own unbelief, I think that's just something I came to on my own, using my own reason and natural skepticism. When I was younger, I used to really be into Nietzsche or Nietzsche, and he had obviously had a lot to say about God. I don't even think Nietzsche really affected, you know, how much I believed or didn't believe in a higher power. Maybe the only, I mean, there is a philosophical idea that's always really resonated with me. 
And that's um, Epicurus's trilemma, or at least it's attributed to Epicurus. And it was later refined or simplified by David Hume. And I like Hume's version. And I believe it can be found in his dialogues concerning natural religion. And Hume himself attributes the, um, the idea to Epicurus. And I actually have the quote here. Epicurus's old questions are yet unanswered. Is he willing to prevent evil but not able? Then is he impotent? Is he able but not willing? Then is he malevolent? Is he both able and willing? Whence then is evil? And uh, it's also sometimes worded in some versions of it as why call him God. Now, this doesn't absolutely rule out the existence of a deity or deities plural, but I think it does shine a light on the problem or problems of the I- that come along with the idea of an all-powerful benign creator God. But it doesn't rule out the idea of an impersonal God, something like you find in Eastern spirituality or religion, this kind of all-pervasive oneness, or, you know, like the Force in Star Wars, or it doesn't rule out a god who maybe isn't benign, maybe even evil, or a god who is incapable of intervention for some reason, or unwilling for whatever reason to intervene. But I'm all uh, philosophized out for now. As always, thanks for listening.